I think everyone thinks free trade, oh, that sounds great, and they don't realize exactly what that means. All we know is what has been released through the press and the media, and I, I usually worry about that. I always wonder what's missing. I, I think it's something that has to be approached with a lot of caution. I don't think it's going to be good for working people in this country. So basically, from a business standpoint, it's the thing to do. But from a humanitarian, United States, people of America point, no, it's not the thing to do. We've all been kind of kept in the dark about something going on and, and directed by people who are uh, uh, just looking at bottom line figures. And I feel they're, they're not looking at all at our quality of life, at um, environmental concerns, worker safety concerns. In the world's financial capitals, behind closed doors, free trade advocates from government, banking, and business are quietly negotiating new rules for international trade. Their aim is to design trade agreements that will eliminate restrictions to expanded trade by transnational corporations. The agreements will establish secretive international panels of unelected officials, mainly from corporations, with vast new powers to undermine our democratic laws. Laws which protect the environment, our health, jobs, and worker safety. Laws which corporations feel impede their profits. If these agreements are ratified as is, meet the leaders of the new world order. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, known as the GATT, was created after World War II. Over 100 countries have signed on to it. The current Uruguay round of negotiations to expand the GATT is focusing on non-tariff barriers to trade, such as environmental controls and restrictions on foreign investment. The North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA, includes the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The goal of the NAFTA is to form a North American trading bloc by fusing the economies of the US, Canada, and Mexico. Under special congressional rules, known as Fast Track, your elected representatives lose their right to amend the agreements. They can only vote yes or no on the entire package. Free trade advocates claim these agreements will benefit all of us. Many people do not agree. Farmers fear they will lose their small farms and way of life to corporate agribusiness. In France, tens of thousands of farmers have taken to the streets to resist the destruction of their farms, a critical part of French culture. In Belgium, farmers have organized tractor demonstrations to protest the changes the GATT will bring. In Holland, Dutch farmers have dumped tons of fresh produce to protest foreign control. In Japan, Japanese farmers have mobilized to retain their ancient farm culture, now threatened by the GATT. And in the United States, coalitions of environmentalists, consumers, farmers, and labor unions are publicly exposing the secret sides of these agreements. Free trade and trade negotiations used to just be about tariffs and trade and commerce, and no one really cared. But all of a sudden, we're finding out it's about our daily lives, the safety of our food, the protection of our jobs, the environment all kinds of elements that we now must begin to study and understand and do something about. What GET is actually trying to do is to get Carl Lewis, for instance, in a 100-meter race to race uh, with an African child of 10 years old who hasn't eaten for three days. And then we say this is free trade. All of you have to start from the same starting point and you end in the same finishing point and the rules are the same for both of you. And then the starter's gun goes off and we know, of course, who will win the race. And if we say that the winner of the race will take everything and the loser will get nothing, then we know how uh, the GATT and the laissez-faire economics is going to result. What we're seeing with the increase in trade and, and so-called free trade is a monolithic, monocultural, urban culture introduced everywhere. And essentially, it's also with the advertising, with the psychological pressure, it's actually creating a sort of Rambo Barbie doll culture wherever you go. Trade advocates deny free trade will threaten our democracy. In the current round, 
the GATT, the NAFTA, are negotiated in secret by the White House. They come back to the Congress completely done with enabling legislation which changes all aspects of federal law to be in compliance with that agreement. So it's a giant document. Congress can debate it for a limited amount of time, can make no changes. It's strictly a rubber stamp, yes or no. And then if it passes by a simple majority, a 50% majority, then it becomes the law of the land. They were negotiated um, in secrecy. They were negotiated with special access to corporate representatives. Citizen groups were excluded. They had no formal advisory rule as citizens or as workers, consumers, or communities. Uh, the corporations, of course, had formal advisory access to these negotiations. They saw the drafts and they came back and forth with the various government representatives. Free trade is going to force all other considerations, labor considerations, environmental protection, to be subsumed under the needs of the market. And people don't realize that this is actually removing power from national governments, which means also that it's removing power from the people who would try to pressure their government to bring in legislation that protects people's interests and the environment. GATT basically makes a, a triviality of all democratic institutions that have been created over centuries, through which societies have made decisions, through which diverse interest groups have resolved their conflicting interests. And it is a setting which creates the rule of monopoly powers. It pretends to do it by removing government intervention and allowing the market uh, to dictate policies. But what's forgotten is that when global corporations have annual budgets, which go way beyond the annual budgets of entire third world countries, how those corporations will dictate the terms is in fact far more totalitarian and far worse in terms of democracy than any government dictatorship. The most outrageous thing, perhaps, of all about the GATT, and it's full of interesting details, is a 15-page proposal tucked into literally the last of 500 pages. It set up a new global commerce agency. They call it the Multilateral Trading Organization. And the way the MTO will work is that through dispute resolution, it will make it possible for one country to challenge another country's laws for instance, an environmental law, on no basis but that it fails to meet trade rules. You have to change your laws on intellectual property. We have to change our laws on um, the, the, the freedom of foreign companies. We have to change our law on services. We have to change our laws on environment, on safety standards, and so on. Uh, so what is then the role of uh, Congress? Or what is the role of Parliament? It will be a very, very limited role. And powers would be transferred to this supra-international organization called the MTO, which will become the most powerful economic agency in the world to which national governments will then have to answer. I think if our people and our public and our media and our Congress and our parliaments knew how much power they are about to surrender, uh, they will not let it happen. Trade advocates claim free trade won't harm the environment. Well, at the moment, the GATT Secretariat claims that countries can improve the environment if GATT is signed because they'll be able to um, sell more products, to trade more, to get money in, to then clean up the environment. But the trouble is that in the process of producing the products to trade, they're going to be destroying the environment further. Whether it's restricting imports of ivory to protect elephants or restricting uh, imports of ozone depleting chemicals, whether it's import restrictions on tuna in order to protect dolphins or other endangered species. These are major levers that we have. GATT would like to take those away by saying that free trade is more important than environmental protection. So if we take free trade to its uh, extreme conclusion, then countries which would like to protect their natural resources on environmental grounds, or on the grounds of conservation, or on the grounds that these resources should be used by local companies so that they earn a higher value added. Uh, 
those laws may, or policies may be negated by this new set of international rules which say that uh, you, you must import or you must export so long as another country wants to import or export from you. Some states, such as Washington and Oregon, have banned the export abroad of raw logs. They want to preserve some of their forests. They want to keep some of these logs going into uh, domestic uh, lumber mills to create more jobs. And they don't want to export uh, their natural resource. Under the proposed trade agreements, Japan uh, and Taiwan and other countries who received these raw logs in the past can say, you can't ban the export of raw logs. That's a trade barrier violating the international agreement that you signed. Many of the world's remaining indigenous tribal peoples are in these remote rainforests in the central Amazon, in the west and central Africa, in the rainforests of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and New Guinea. And they don't stand to benefit from free trade. Free trade means the annihilation of their forests for the world tropical timber market, and it probably means genocide. It means death and destruction. It's a real scary situation. The U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act has required that countries that want to enjoy U.S. markets must have comparable environmental protection requirements for dolphins. Mexico didn't have those requirements and was killing up to 50,000 dolphins a year. As a result of that, under U.S. law, an embargo was placed against Mexican tuna imports. No different than the U.S. requirements, but simply saying that if you want to enjoy our markets, you must meet the similar level of environmental protection requirements. GATT said that's illegal. That's an illegal violation of free trade and tried to strike that down. So that, I think, was the most clear indication that we've had yet of the threat that GATT poses to the environment. If we want to democratize the world and get to a sustainable society that's ecologically healthy, then we have got to get rid of this current concept of free trade and growth for the sake of growth. Trade advocates claim free trade won't endanger the safety of our food. Farmers in the United States have been uh, trying to shift their methods of production using fewer chemicals, using more safe production methods. And they've been trying to communicate to the public about the need for greater attention to quality, food safety questions. And I think in a successful way, it's a long-term process. With the GATT and with the NAFTA negotiations, one of the key elements of those agreements is a process, a kind of an obscure process called harmonization. It doesn't sound so bad, that word harmonization. It's a euphemism. It means leveling standards downward to an international lower common denominator. The way it works is that both the GATT and the NAFTA expose countries' high standards as trade barriers to be challenged and brought downwards. In the UK, for example, there are over 300 food additives permitted at the moment. The new EC list is going to increase that number to well over 400. And the staggering thing about that is that the UK had the longest list to start with. For countries like Greece and Germany, which only permitted about 150 additives, they're going to have a mammoth increase to over 400. Free trade will encourage biotechnology, which is gene splicing in our food. And large multinational corporations will do that, whereas a small family farm won't. Biotechnology is splicing hog genes with tomato genes and putting that product into the food supply. Now, we don't know for sure if it's dangerous, but we don't know that it's safe either. Codex Alimentarius literally means the law of food. It's the name of an international organization based in Rome that sets food standards. Until now, Codex's rules about inspection, contamination, sanitary handling, packaging, they've only been advisory. In both the GATT and the NAFTA, Codex is announced to be the standard for world trade. And this organization is packed with industry representatives. If you look at some of the delegations, for example, the Swiss delegation, at the last meeting on pesticides, there were seven members of the delegation, and five of those were actually from chemical companies. So what these uh, GATT negotiations are aiming at is to standardize government regulations in relation to corporate behavior, and worse, to reduce those standards 
or to eradicate those standards altogether. Trade advocates claim free trade won't threaten our jobs. I think that at this point we need to protect the American economy and I don't think we need to open up possibilities for jobs going out of the country. I'm mostly concerned about Mexico uh, because I think that's going to take away a lot of American industry. And so there'll just be more competition and probably more prejudice against Mexican workers. If NAFTA goes through as President Bush and Salinas and Prime Minister Mulroney have negotiated. I think it'll have very bad consequences for the majority of working people in the United States. As jobs move from the United States to Mexico, the jobs that remain will have their wages bid down, and some jobs will be permanently lost. Thousands of U.S. manufacturing jobs have been lost to Mexico through the Maquiladora program. Started 27 years ago on the border of Texas and Mexico, the Maquiladoras established a free trade enterprise zone where U.S. companies can build factories and take advantage of low wages and lax environmental and workplace regulations. Basic human needs such as adequate housing, water and sewage treatment, and health care are unavailable for most workers and their families. Some earn as little as $6 a day. The NAFTA would expand this practice to the rest of Mexico. Matamoros, for instance, was a gem in the border. It was a small town that had primarily an agricultural ranching base, some tourism. And then 27 years after, the maquiladoras moved in. The US companies moved in and established their, their factories. We now have conditions that are just as bad as Honduras, as Haiti, uh, El Salvador, or worse. And we want NAFTA to be crafted in such a way that we first pay attention to the problems created by the last time the big uh, government agencies and the politicians were telling us, this is good for you. So what we fully expect is going to happen is that people that are in the hopes of a better life in Mexico, of which there are many hoping for that life, will come to the northern part of Mexico where companies are going to be set up. And they will work for whatever's offered to them. They will try to set up housing wherever it's available. They will increase the number of population along the northern Mexico border that presently, as, as we know, has no infrastructure. It's like a time bomb with a fuse that's lit. In 1988, the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement was signed. Since then, Canadians have seen their quality of life erode as their national social systems disintegrate, jobs are lost, and their natural resources are exploited. The NAFTA will likely make matters worse. Our ancestors had to create national institutions, uh, transfer payments from the wealthier regions of the country to the poorer countries, national social programs, a national broadcasting system, a national airline, and a, a railway, and so on, so that we'd be linked across the country. What we've been told under these agreements is you can't have that anymore. You can't use government, or government is, not, is no longer empowered to create these east-west links. If they're not market-driven, if, if they don't happen naturally through the market, they've got to go. We've had this program of hospital insurance and health insurance since the early 60s. It has been a major success and is supported by all parties, left, right, and center. If, however, we continue with the trading agreements that are being presented to us, and we continue to pressure for incorporating a low-wage partner such as Mexico, the tax base that is necessary across the board to supply this health care service will disappear. What NAFTA does is, it in fact, extend the kinds of openings for uh, multinational corporations to enter into provision of health care services in a country which has traditionally had a one-payer uh, state-provided type service. So what it does is open the door through very clear language that says multinational corporations must be given an opportunity to bid on any new services that might be provided. And under the intellectual property agreement, 
uh, of NAFTA. We are giving uh, patent rights to transnational pharmaceuticals, which means, of course, that our programs to help our elderly and people on welfare and so on with cheaper drug prices and to have a generic industry in this country to produce cheaper drugs is gone. We have lost uh, close to 600,000 manufacturing jobs in this country. And I'm not talking about jobs in various other public services and social services and everything else, but we're just talking about uh, 600,000 jobs lost in the manufacturing sector during this period of time. During the Great Depression in Canada, the highest number of job losses was 30% of our secondary and tertiary jobs, and we got most of those back. The jobs we've lost since we signed the free trade agreement with the United States, most will not be back. The argument was made was that with a free trade agreement, uh, companies will be able to operate here in Canada just like they were uh, nationals of our own country and, and, and therefore uh, we would attract a lot more foreign investment. That simply hasn't happened. Foreign investment we've got has gone towards buying up existing companies rather than creating new jobs. So the great promises of new jobs uh, under the free trade agreement is a laughing stock. I look, for instance, at our own resources in this country. We're told we're resource rich, wonderful water and, and woods and trees and so on. Yes, they happen to be on, on something called Canada, but when they don't belong to the Canadian people and governments are not able to control them because through free trade, uh, the movement of these resources has to go back and forth as un uninhibited as possible. The decisions are made between the large corporations, the buyers and the sellers, and in effect those trees and that water might as well be on the other side of the world for all the benefit it does us and all the control we have over it. Trade advocates ignore how free trade will affect our small farms and our regional cultures. The agriculture proposals in GATT are really designed to help the large multinational corporations, the seed companies, the fertilizer and chemical companies, tighten their control over the food system. It's family farmers who lose out, it's consumers who lose out when a few giant companies control the very germ plasma that makes up the seeds that are, that are what our future is based on. Right now, the average pound of food in America travels 2,000 miles. With free trade, it's going to be traveling three, four, five thousand 5,000 miles. What we're doing all the time then is putting research and the entire infrastructure into expanding the transport infrastructure so we're going to have more and more superhighways, more and more lorries carrying food further and further away. Uh, our farms are spread all over the country. We have uh, small uh, communities and uh, a lot of special cultures and we are, this farming um, is based upon the use of the local resources uh, and uh, this will not be able to, um, uh, to go on in uh, uh, the much harder uh, competition in, uh, uh, in a more industrialized uh, farming system. Si on n'est pas d'accord avec la signature des accords du GATT, c'est parce qu'au niveau de l'agriculture, ça ne permettra plus à chaque pays ou à chaque groupe de pays, comme la communauté européenne, de défendre euh, un modèle agricole de petite paysannerie. The hedgerows, which are so important to our UK countryside, the sort of mixture of farms, the, the woods, the hills, the little fields, all gone. Food factories in some areas and sort of green areas in other parts of the countryside, and the two never meet. It's a sort of zoned countryside. But we're talking about greatly escalating and increasing economic pressures on people to leave the land, to leave their local regional economies in pursuit of jobs in the cities, in ever larger urban centers. What happens in the process is that they totally lose the connection with their particular environment, with their cultural tradition, with the architecture that they have uh, you know, developed and evolved in their own region for centuries.
there won't be a culture, there won't be people to keep that culture alive, and there won't be people to keep ecology alive through that culture, because they'll be turned or into overnight destitutes very much of the kind we see in Africa. Africa's crisis is ecological because people have been forced to move out of rural areas because cheap food imports has forced them to stop being agriculturists and farmers. The real issue of free trade is that it will destroy a way of life, a culture, uh, the, very the very basis of, of what we believe in here in America, which is rural life, community life, the family, and the independence of the small entrepreneur. All over the world, from the United States to the former Soviet Union, new governments are coming into power. Worldwide trade agreements are up for renegotiation. This is a brand new opportunity for all of us to seize the initiative. So in whichever country we come from, in the third world countries, in the northern countries, we have to insist that our parliaments, our congresses, and our people continue to have the choice of decision making as to what kind of economic, social, environmental, and cultural life we want. And in order for us to do this, we have to oppose uh, the Uruguay Round and the multilateral trade organization it is trying to set up. Because once that is set up, we will see the rapid erosion of all our rights. The good news is it's not too late. We can do something. You can lobby your politicians. You can talk to local councillors. You can say, we don't want it. Yes, of course, we need a system of trade rules. But instead of putting trade itself on the throne, you've got to put things like um, uh, environment and health and security of employment and good working conditions and building up rural communities. Those things have got to be put on the throne. GATT will never do that, but if we all work together and put pressure on the politicians now, we can get a different kind of agreement. Citizens can do two things. First, make sure that all the organizations that we're part of, our church, our school, our trade union, our community groups, understand the importance and the potential implications. And next, and most important, to make sure our views are known, especially to Congress, where the ultimate decision will come down. Congress has to know that we're watching and that we want the interest of the common citizens, not just the transnational corporations, considered when the final GATT, NAFTA, or any other trade agreement comes before them. For more information and to join the Citizens Trade Campaign, now organized nationwide, please call this number, 888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-888-